Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today we'll be taking a look at the Traveler scenario High and Dry. Written by Martin Doherty and published in 2016 by Mongoose Publishing as part of their second edition line. Coming in at 42 pages, the scenario itself is actually pretty short. It's got a lot of potential for roleplay and a good deal of Game Master information about several worlds that appear in the Spinward Marches. The module is designed as a potential opener for a campaign where a group of lucky travelers receive a new ship. A brand new starship? Hell yeah! I for one was worried that getting our first ship was going to take a while or come with all these strings attached. So I am happy to hear that that didn't take us any work at all. Oh, I didn't say there weren't any strings attached, and while the ship might be new for you, it is not going to be a new ship. Okay, uh, gently used then. I can handle gently used. Yeah, I wouldn't call it gently used either, but hey, a free ship is a free ship. Now, for the sake of full disclosure, I was sent this copy of High and Dry by Mongoose Publishing in order to use it for this review. Now, how it happened was back in March, uh, Matt Sprange with Mongoose reached out to me. He was extremely complimentary of the review that I had done for Mongoose Paranoia, and he was wanting to know if I'd be interested in looking at some more of Mongoose's lineup for in order to do reviews, and one of which was including Traveler. And I told him that I'd be willing to look at it, but my review policy is pretty simple, and that's I'm not going to review a product unless I've personally played it myself, and I am not going to go through all the effort of learning a new system and getting all my players involved and taking time out of their lives if I don't think this is something that we're going to enjoy. So even if he sent it, I couldn't guarantee that we would play it, and therefore if I don't play it, I'm not going to review it. Uh, but Matt said that he was absolutely confident that Traveler was going to win us over, so he sent me a couple of the core books and two of the modules, one of which being High and Dry. And I am happy to report that he was absolutely right. Our group is currently gearing up to do a full Traveler campaign now. I've now picked up a couple more of the core books. I picked up the Game Master screen and some miniatures and a bunch of little accessories like that. And it all started with our first test game, which was with High and Dry. However, there are still a few spots in this scenario that Game Masters are going to work on if they want to be able to run this adventure for themselves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer my criticisms and my suggestions as a Game Master who has successfully run this adventure. And I'm Jack the NPC. I'm going to give this one to you from a player's side of things as well well as my usual peanut gallery sort of comments. But before we can go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players out there, if you have any interest in experiencing the scenario, please stop here. But do send your Game Master this way to see if High and Dry would be a good fit for your group. Okay, Game Masters, let's get this thing started. As I said, the scenario takes place in this section of worlds. It comes with several pages of information about five of the worlds in the Bowman Arm, and it takes up the first quarter of the module, which is now completely packed with all sorts of great information about these worlds. The scenario opens on Flamerian Highport. The Scout Services has recently repossessed a ship from its former crew who neglected it and got themselves thrown in jail. The travelers can either be picking the ship up for themselves, as if they're going to take possession of it, or they could just merely be sent to go pick the ship up for scout services if your player characters already have a ship. The ship is the Scout Courier High and Dry, which according to its former crew, broke down on the planet of Walston. The traveler's job is to go to the planet of Walston with some cargo crates of fresh parts, repair the ship, and then fly it back to Flamarian Station where it can go through a full overhaul. They're going to be given some expense funds for this job, some fuel vouchers, and then some passage there. Once the High and Dry is then returned and given its proper refit, the player characters are going to be offered a one-year lease on the ship and a job with Scout Services. So just to make sure I got this right, all we got to do is fly out to this ship, swap out a couple circuit boards, reinstall windows, and fly that puppy on home. Well, this thing is going to be a cakewalk. Easy peasy, I am sure nothing is going to go wrong here. The trip to Walston is pretty straightforward. The travelers are going to hitch a ride on a far trader, and they're going to make a single stop along the way to a very small and remote outpost on a backwater planet. The whole journey is going to take them roughly three weeks to complete to get to Walston. For our game, I used this time while they were on the ship to get them to know the NPC crew, and the NPC crew was able to kind of teach them how space travel and some of the different mechanics of the world work as far as jumping and uh, reading the universal world profile system and that sort of thing. 
thing. I also was able to just inject some of the basic world building as what the world of Traveler is like. Now, Game Masters should keep this entire journey part going as long as your players remain interested in it. You know, let them visit that outpost, let them get out and stretch their legs, maybe explore a little bit while the ship is refueling. Uh, but this is all just going to be color in order to keep your game interesting. There's nothing really important that happens along the way. Uh, just have fun and do a lot of role play here, but there's nothing that you need to keep doing in case your players aren't really into it. For us, we just visited the cantina and had their local brew called Face Pila. It's a lot like turpentine, but not quite as smooth. Eventually, they're going to arrive at the planet of Walston, where the entire 3,000-person population is limited to a single large island. We get a good deal of information about this planet, from its passively racist dictatorship to the various life forms that can be found there and the culture. I really love the level of detail that they included it, and most of this information is going to be available to the player characters on the ship's library before they arrive, so you can give them as much information as they are wanting to look up. Now, once the PCs arrive and start, Town, the planet's only spaceport, they're going to have to pass through customs. Being a law level 8 planet, the PCs are going to be asked to leave behind any weapons or visible armor, and they're going to have to leave those in some lockers that they can rent for 10 credits a week at the starport. Wait, so you were telling me that I can't bring my beloved guns onto this planet? Yeah, guys, I got a bad feeling we're going to want these things at some point on this adventure. Then once they're through customs, they start asking around about this ship, because they're going to assume the ship is going to be parked at the starport. They're going to discover that nobody knows where this ship is. Whoa, 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 what do you mean there is no ship here? Scout services sent us to this crappy little planet in order to pick up our ship. So you just check your little computer there again and find my ship. Module recommends that we use a lot of social skills here, such as Persuade or Diplomat, but also suggests that you allow them to use some different skills such as Admin, because they're going to have to navigate all the weird bureaucracy of this planet. Anyway, because the module talks about there's a lot of bureaucracy where the player characters aren't really asking about something that they're not supposed to be able to ask about, but there's no uh, policies or procedures in place, and the people behind the counter have to keep kind of calling higher and higher because they don't really know how to answer the questions for the travelers. So it's a a lot of red tape, and anybody that's ever had to deal with the DMV should be able to really be able to express this, but think of it as being more on a planetary level. Eventually, the player characters are going to discover a couple things. One, the former crew of the High and Dry was a bunch of unpopular jerks that everyone absolutely hated. Uh, they trashed hotel rooms, they made fun of the locals, they started fights, they were just a bunch of all-around unlikable people, and they had a reputation on the planet as being unlikable people. This might come back on the crew, because the new crew of travelers is going to be on the ship, so therefore they might be considered uh, guilty by association, depending on who they're talking to. And the second thing they'll discover is that the High and Dry was involved in some sort of government contract. And if the player characters want to know what's going on with the ship and where it is, they're going to have to take the train to the capital city to get some answers. The capital city of Central Lake is pathetically small. They're going to enter an understaffed planetary palace, where they're going to have to wait around for some time before anybody even notices that they're there. And then they're going to be taken to a room and introduced to the Minister of Off-World Affairs, Public Relations, and Fisheries, meaning he's got a really, really busy card. He'll explain to the player characters that the High and Dry crew ran off after they agreed to doing a government contract about some important survey work that it was, and they had already been paid for this job. And while the minister does understand that this crew is not the same crew that he had made the deal with, he's already paid this money and they now consider the high and dry kind of collateral on this deal that this other crew bailed out on. So he's going to kind of insist that the player characters agree to finish this job that the former crew uh, didn't do, that they got paid for, uh, in order for them to get the ship. So the PCs are going to be offered a very small amount of money to do this job, but most more or less they're going to have to clean up the mistake that this former crew had done. If the player characters agree, he's going to inform the High and Dry is now located inside the crater of a volcano that the former crew was supposed to be surveying for the government. Inside a volcano? Yeah, guys, I am sure that there is no chance it's going to erupt on us this adventure. The player characters are going to need to travel now to the far side of the island and then figure out how to get up and over and into this volcano. It's a climb of 1,400 meters in an already very thin atmosphere. The whole climbing section here feels a little bit forced to me. I get that there's no grav cars on this planet. It's not a very high-tech level planet. Uh, but there should be some other means in order to get over the rim of the volcano versus just 
climbing in. It is a backwater planet, but there is some technology that should still be available to them if they know where to ask. But the complete lack of other options that are available really does annoy me. I suggest that Game Masters add the possibility that if your players start asking around, do enough role playing, maybe pay a little bit of money to the right people, that they could have access to, let's say, a gyrocopter captain. And that captain, if for a small fee, will be able to fly them up and over and into the volcano like one at a time on his tiny little gyrocopter. Or maybe he could rent it to them and now the player characters are going to have to fly it themselves. So if you had a player character who, who went ahead and got the flying skill, they can now save the day and prevent everybody from having to do this long and arduous climb because they were smart enough to get the flying skill and now they're a bit of a hero and they get to roll uh, on this skill that they probably didn't think they were ever going to be able to really roll on that much. Otherwise, the PCs are going to have to climb a mountain. Now, the climb is pretty straightforward. The thin atmosphere does lead to a few problems with high altitude sickness, so the player characters are going to have to get some rebreathers or something like that in order to avoid the altitude sickness. Now, since this is a common piece of equipment and it's of a low enough tech level that it should be available on the planet, I ruled that any travelers that didn't already have one on their character sheet could pick up a rebreather at the starport, which means they then had to uh, take the train all the way back to the starport. And then it was going to be one to six of them are going to be available, because just because it is the right tech level, there's not that much need for them. So the PCs had to go all the way back, and then maybe or maybe not, there'd be enough rebreathers for all of them to get one. While I'm on the subject of the player characters asking around and trying to get gyrocopters and rebreathing masks and other supplies like that, one recommend that I give to Game Masters as far as role-playing all the locals on this planet is have everybody kind of related to each other somehow. Not necessarily by blood, but they kind of have that small-town relations that you occasionally come across, such as, you know, oh yeah, you guys want to rent a truck who you should talk to would be my wife's brother's neighbor Joe. He's got a truck you might be able to borrow or rent there, yes siree. Otherwise, uh, my uh, buddy Tom's kid's teacher, her husband has a truck you could borrow, so yes indeed, I know a few people you could get a truck from. I find that it really drives home that kind of small town feel that this entire planet has, and it does it in kind of amusing way, it can lead to a few laughs. Scaling the mountain proved to be a huge obstacle for Russ. Even with the air mass to counteract the altitude sickness, all the athletics checks and the damage that failed athletics checks caused meant that one of our player characters died before before we reach the top of it. I'd have much preferred it if they'd given us a couple different options of ways we could have overcome this obstacle, rather than just being all like, hey, here you go, here's a mountain, now go climb it. Once they make it over, the player characters will discover that the high and dry is parked on a little island in the middle of the volcano's caldera. Oh, it is not enough that that former crew had to park their ship inside the crater of a volcano, but they had to park it on an island inside a crater of a volcano? I swear, guys, if we ever find this former crew, I am going to whoop their butts. Not only that, but the crew then stripped the vehicle for anything that was valuable and kind of strewed trash everywhere else. Uh, they also abandoned their pet, this big guard dog there, which is now running around inside this crater. It is starving. It is willing to attack anything that it sees because it's starving to death and it's going to be very, very aggressive. So it's very likely going to try to kill one of the travelers. Have I mentioned how much I hate this form of crew yet? What kind of monster abandons their pet dog? Once the PCs make it to the ship, which is just a standard scout ship from the core book, but it is going to be trash. The PCs are going to take a few days in order just to install all the parts and updating the software, uh, but because these crates that they brought along are idiot-proof, there's not much chance that they're going to fail in this reinstall and repair of the ship. Uh, just simply have the player characters, you know, make their skill rolls and everything like that. Give it a, a low difficulty level, but if they fail it, just make it mean that it took more time in order for them to do it right. Also, so either tell them in the installation instructions or just have them make some piloting checks or engineering checks in order for your player characters just to know this, but they're going to actually have to do a few further tests on the ship before they're able to fly it once those repairs are made. They need to make sure that everything is all working correctly, so they'll have to do some uh, simulations and a couple test flights and everything like that before they can safely fly it. So there is a second step that has to be done. However, make it clear that the best way that they should be able to test the new J-Drive out is that they're going to have to take 
take it to the starport station or to use all the machinery there. So all they need to do now is just get the maneuver drive working to get the ship out of the volcano and over to the starport. That way they can begin working on the J drive somewhere where it, that has the proper facilities for it. Also, if the player characters have to visit the starport in order to get their ship jump worthy again, it might encourage them to do that survey job before they just try to skip town. Speaking of the survey, the player characters are probably going to start working on that somewhere in here, but whether they do or they don't, the volcano is going to begin rumbling on them. The whole eruption portion is really exciting, but like the climbing obstacle that they had to do just to get into the volcano, it's also extremely linear, and it's assuming that the player characters are going to follow a very set order of things, which of course my players didn't follow that order at all. Essentially, the whole volcano eruption comes in stages. Before the ship is fully uh, functional, before it could fully fly, there's going to be a low, long rumble, and then the pond that was around the ship is going to slowly drain out. And that's the first clue that something bad is going to happen. And then once the ship is actually ready to fly, after maybe they've done the simulations or the tests like that, that's when the volcano is going to fully explode on them. Play this part up. Have uh, collision sensors going off as like rocks and debris and little shrubs are now raining down from the sky, and the ship all thinks that it's incoming missiles and all the alarms are sounding, it's going crazy. Uh, have the radio suddenly going nuts as all the local government officials are calling because they're desperate for reports and they're sending out all these warnings to all the little towns around the volcano. Have it suddenly be this suddenly kind of explosion of sounds and sirens that the player characters are all dealing with. Now the local government's going to ask for their help on this and if the player characters decide to help, the first task that they're going to have to do is just monitor the volcano, let the local authorities know where any lava is going and what the status is, what the local authorities are trying to evacuate all the little small towns that are around the base of the volcano. The module just assumes that this is all going to be done by the player characters flying their ship, you know, circling it really low, having to make a couple pilot tin checks in order to do all this. Why would we endanger ourselves by flying near that thing? This ship comes equipped with probe drones. I mean, this is quite literally the job that this ship is designed to do and what those probe drones are for. The module makes no mention of using the drones for this job, but I really think they should. After all, the pilot's going to have to be doing a ton of piloting checks before the scenario is over anyway, so you might as well let the person that actually has the remote ops skill be able to use their skill and save the day and uh, prevent all the PCs from being in danger because they're like, I happen to have remote ops, I can do this job and you guys don't have to put yourself in danger. In fact, make that character make a lot of roles dealing with all the drones around there as uh, uh, different drones are getting taken out by flying debris and you know it becomes more and more tense as the number of drones that they've got in the air it keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller as more smoke and debris is filling the air uh, but this time the player character is looking at it going okay well, hopefully we don't lose too many hopefully we don't have to go in there if we lose all our drones eventually after this has been going on a while the player character is going to be asked to see if they can help with some of the final evacuations uh, people that missed the last train out of town or people whose car wrecked along the way now this can lead to a good little moral dilemma for the player characters because because if they go to rescue the evacuees before the final big explosion of this volcano, it means that they're going to be placing themselves within the path of pyroclastic flow. Now when the flow hits, go ahead and tell your players or make your pilot do a piloting check to see if your uh, pilot just happens to know all this information. But there's three ways that they could handle getting hit by the pyroclastic flow. They could either try to fly out and above it, try to get out of it in time, but they're still going to be taking a good brunt of all that debris. Or they could try to race it out to sea and then dive under the water and let it go above them, or they can just turn their ship directly into the path of the flow because the ship is aerodynamic and it's going to allow a lot of it to go around them, and that's actually the best way of doing it. But I, if I was playing this, wouldn't have known that would have been the best way of doing it. I wouldn't have even thought of that as an option. So let your pilot character know this and give them a pilot role to see if they even think about this, and if they make the role, tell them that this is a good viable option, and that way they can still feel like, you know, uh, they were able to think of it on their own even if it was through a roll. Once the cloud hits, everything Thing is going to go completely nuts on them. Uh, the power on the ship is going to go out, so now your engineer is going to have to repair the, the ship, and then your pilot's going to ultimately have to make three different piloting checks in order to get out of the flow. Uh, no matter which way they took it, just the damage that it causes is going to be different depending on which of the three options there were, but it is going to require three piloting checks in order to make it out of this thing safely. Providing that the player characters did rescue some of the evacuees, they're going to be 
hailed as heroes once this is all done. And while the government doesn't have enough money to you know, pay them some sort of huge reward for what they've done, they are going to be local heroes and local celebrities, and that's going to give them a few perks like that when they're dealing with anyone else on the planet. Essentially, I now have a crappy town on a crappy planet where I am a big local hero. The Firefly fan in me is perfectly happy with this. Essentially, that's just the end of the adventure right there. Now, for my group, I did add a scene where after the travelers had left the planet, before they reached jump distance, they ran into the crew of another ship that was mad at the old crew of the High and Dry for uh, skipping town because it was some sort of cargo they were supposed to be picking up, and they were confusing who was in the ship, and the player characters are all like, no, 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 that's the last crew, we have nothing to do with this. But it ended up leading to a small uh, ship-to-ship -ship combat because we were were trying out that system, but that was just something that I added to add a little bit of a, a, a fun little boost at the very end of the scenario. Overall, we had a lot of fun with this adventure. I do just absolutely love the story hook. I love the journey getting there and all the information they could get and all the, the various worlds and all the elements like that. Uh, I love dealing with the bureaucracy of the planet and all the little quirks that it has, uh, as well as all the things that happen because the player characters have to clean up the mess from this previous crew of the ship that they're taking over. However, I found a lot of this module being just a little too long-winded, especially on how the eruption scene plays out. I mean, that scene itself takes over seven pages to describe in the module. Uh, it's so long that it becomes more like reading a story than an easy way for a game master to run a story. Also, while the module does warn against being railroady in how you run this, I found much of the scenario too linear in how it was able to approach things with a very kind of lack of secondary options. Uh, as way you, you could do alternate methods of going over the volcano, or crossing, or finding out where the ship was in the first place, or ways to deal with the eruption scene at all. If your players happen to follow the precise path that the module assumes that they're, you're going to do, then great, it's going to work perfectly for you. However, players never ever follow the direct path that you're going to assume they do, so it's best just to assume that they're not going to follow any single set path, and I wish the module had given us a few options of different things that they might try in order for Game Masters to be better prepared for that. So Game Masters, prepare a couple options for different ways that they might approach different problems, uh, different ways that they might be able to use some different skill roles and everything like that, uh, such as finding out where the ship is. Maybe they don't want to take this government contract, or getting over the mountain, or different ways they might have to be able to uh, handle the volcano, be helpful in the volcano, but don't necessarily have to do the only things that the module talks about they do during the eruption scene. The module provides a lot of great obstacles and areas for roleplay, and can easily be played without doing any combat at all, uh, or easily adapted to include combat for anybody that wants to have a little bit more excitement in the game as far as combat. It also provides a spectacular springboard to launch into a campaign where your uh, travelers have to do their first job, they get a ship, uh, they get a career with the scout services that's going to lead to further adventures, uh, they might have enemies from this former crew that are now going to be tracking them down because they're in the ship that this group of jerks used to fly, or maybe the former crew crew was going to get out of jail, and now they're going to come back looking for their ship. So it leaves a lot of hooks for future adventures, and I really do like that about it. So, in conclusion, if you're new to Traveler, or if you're in Traveler and you want to start off a new campaign, and you're looking for a good adventure to start a new campaign with, I definitely recommend that you give High and Dry a look. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, like game reviews and Game Master Toolbox, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, travelers, you have a great day.